were threatened by their enemy. It looked pretty grim for them. They didn't know what they was going to do. They was vastly outnumbered. And King Jehoshaphat gathered all the people together. And he led them in a time of fasting and a prayer to God. Listen to this portion of his prayer in verse 12. O oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? Lord, how come are the enemies winning here? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do. But our eyes are upon thee. Lord, there's an overwhelming enemy. I don't know what's going to happen. This is the king. He's supposed to have it all together. He's supposed to have the plan. And yet he humbly and contritely says, God, I'm looking to you for what to do. And listen to how God responds to that humble and contrite man. In verse 15, Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for this battle is not yours, but it's God's. Okay, faith is starting to come into the picture a little bit here. Drop down to verse 17, it gets better. You shall not need to fight in this battle. That's my kind of a battle right there. <laughs> I don't have to do it. God's going to take care of it. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they was unified. They was worshiping God, the scripture says, bowed on their face before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat appointed singers before the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. Do you have this picture? This is a battle. You've seen medieval knights with swords and with maces and with spears. Vicious group of men coming against them, and they're sending out the praise team. Hey, we're going to come out and praise in front of you. But listen what happens. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the enemy which were come against Judah and they were smitten Judah didn't have to do the battle they just had to worship God which is exactly where pastor has been leading us if you've been facing a difficult situation you're in the right place as you lift up worship today while the worship was happening the Lord sent ambushments against the enemy I know we have several folks who need prayer right off the bat brother Brad Adams had to go to the ER yesterday for the mounts remains in the hospital. Sister Becky Robinson is still getting daily infusions of antibiotics. She should know this next week. She's done with that, still to fight that infection, still requesting prayer. Sister Becky Dahl is here, but lots of, of sickness requested special prayer this afternoon. Let's take these to God as we open up. And as we worship through the remainder of this service, let's trust God is working right now on the behalf of these needs and whatever need you have. Let's open in prayer. Jesus, I thank you for my brothers and sisters who are gathered here in your name. We come in faith believing that you hear and that you answer, that your great love is towards your children, Lord, even when we aren't deserving, and we, when we don't feel that we've measured up. We're still your children. We're the apple of your eye. Lord, we gather in faith, believing, worshiping you, lifting up your name, remaining faithful in this house today. And I ask a special anointing of your grace to minister to every single person here. Remove every doubt, every fear, every unbelief. God, we speak a rebuke against sickness, against disease, against things that would hinder your children from receiving victory today. Lord, I ask you to speak healing into Brother Mount's body into Brother Adam's body, into Sister Robbins, into Sister Dahl specifically, everyone else who's lifting up a request, I ask your healing to happen. But Lord, more than that, I ask a spiritual anointing to happen in the sanctuary today. As faith rises and as your spirit begins moving, quicken us, draw us closer to you, help us to leave this place ready to be witnesses of your gospel. Let the anointing be upon this house. Let your glory move. We worship you and give you praise together in Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord.
I stand here humble. I worship you. I thank you, Lord. God, that you died for me. So I can up a hallelujah with a heart of thanksgiving God we praise you says now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty and I believe he is here today the Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people I believe he is here he is moving I thank you Lord Jesus God in faith in trust God in hope we believe God that you hear our prayers that God you're walking through the aisles of this building hallelujah
towards you. I am committed, oh God, to your cause. I'm committed to your kingdom. I'm committed to your praise and your worship. I can't get enough of your presence. I can't get enough of your anointing. I can't get enough of your grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What is life about anyway? What is life about anyway? If our life is about anything other than Jesus Christ, it's in chaos right now. If our life is about anything other than the kingdom of God, it's in turmoil and on shaky ground right now. <laughs> oh, but if your life is hid in Christ... Come on, if God means everything to you, let this world come and go. It's not going to matter. You know, one of these days, the Bible says that the very elements of this earth is going to melt with fervent heat. What then? You think this is bad. I don't want to be tied to this world. I don't want my happiness tied to this world, its events, its... It's security, it's peace. No. No. I said last week, humans are fickle. And you know who runs this world? Human. They're fickle. They don't seek God. I wish they did. I pray that they do. How about you? You pray for the leaders or are you just mad at them? <laughs> Matt, being mad at him don't do any good. Pray for him. Amen. Only God knows where this thing's going to lead. But I know that God is going. Is there static in this thing? Every once in a while it buzzing. Maybe it's just the anointing that I feel in this room. How many of you feel the presence of God in this place? Hallelujah. We love you, God. And I don't know about you, but I purposed in my heart, I'm never going to stop. I purposed in my heart, I'm going to be a worshiper. I'm going to be a worshiper regardless. What, what are the choices do we have? Are you be a worshiper or you be a grumbler? I've been both. Whining and complaining didn't get me anywhere, Brother Grant. It just kept me in the vortex going down. How many ever catch yourself in a vortex? You know, the longer you keep your eyes on the problem and on the issues and the situation, whether it's the pandemic, the protest, the election, our economic status, our health, our lives, the longer you keep your eyes on the earthly, you're just going to spiral because you go where you're looking. This is a, it, I used an analogy earlier today about the airplane. What if I get your cooties? Oh, uh, at least I won't have static. I was talking about the airplane earlier today. Well, I learned something. Brother Grant and I took a motorcycle ride the other day. I love motorcycles, and there's something I learned about motorcycles early on. I mean, real early on. Like I was five years old, my uncle put me on a Honda mini bike. You know what those are, brother? Remember that little fat fender mini bike? 
Honda. Uncle Bill, that big old front yard he had, one little tree in that front yard. He said, Jeffrey, ride anywhere you want in the front yard. Just don't hit my tree. I learned something about motorcycle riding. You go where you're looking. A whole half acre front yard. I ran into that little bitty tree. I tried to get around it. I, tr- I did everything I could. But the whole, in my mind, the tree, the tree, the tree. Whack. Our lives are much the same way. You're going to go where you're looking. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your perspective. Your perspective. Look unto God, the author and the finisher of your faith. Don't look at the circumstances around you, brothers and sisters. They're spinning out of control. And if you look at them, you're going to follow them. But lift up your eyes. talking to Sister Mounts the other day and she was so distraught. Her husband's in the hospital. Tumor right next to his aorta. They don't know what's going on. She was getting so upset. I said, Sister, you don't know, right? No. I said, so it could be good. Yes. I said, just good chance of being good is bad, right? Yes. You used to live next to the river. I said, did you ever see the eagles? As they would launch off of a high place. And they would flap their wings just enough to get into the atmosphere. And they would begin to soar until they found a current going up. And then they just set their wings. All they did was begin to spiral. The difference is... They lifted up their head. They didn't become concerned with the earthly. And just like you and I can spiral into the earth whenever we watch our situations and our problems, they lift their wings and they find the updraft and they just set their wings and they begin to spiral into the heavens. You and I can do the same thing. When you find a situation that bothers you, you can determine whether or not I'm going to focus on my problem, I'm going to focus on my situation. And brother and sister, I promise you, you'll spiral right down into depression with the situation or you can look up to heaven the author and the finisher of your faith and you can find the wind of the spirit and set your wings set your spirit as it were oh come on they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with the wings of the eagle and once the eagle finds the updraft all he's got to do is set his set his face set his course no more effort is needed as the spirit, as the wind drives him into the heavens. If you could just get into the presence of God, it wouldn't take any more effort than you find in yourself into the presence of God and allow him to lift you up out of your problem, lift you up out of your dilemma, lift you up out of, of your situation, out of your depression, your oppression, out of your pain, out of your bitterness, out of your problem, and just set your wings to find the spirit and allow God to lift you up we love you God because we couldn't do this on our own I can't get enough of your presence in this crazy world that I live in I need you Jesus precious Jesus oh hallelujah hallelujah I started a subject last week obviously I did not get finished I didn't get finished in either of the two previous services. I threw some good stuff under the bus just because I don't want to belabor a point. I want to give you a chance to respond. And I will tell you that at the end of every service this weekend, we have had a powerful demonstration of the presence of God. I want to encourage you today to encourage yourself. I can only do so much, but you can make the difference in your world, you and Jesus. 
And it's your worship that makes a difference. I said it's your worship that makes a difference. We all got situations. We all have situations and things that happen in our life. And when I allow that situation to influence me, in essence, I begin to worship it. Because worship is to yield yourself to an influence. Submit yourself to an influence. That's worship. When a problem comes in my life, Sister Amber, and I allow my spirit to be affected by the issue, I begin to worship it. I yield myself to the situation. We, we don't think about it that way. But it's so true. You're human. So you're affected when natural things happen to you. It's okay. But realize what's happening. And turn it around. The Bible says that the Word of God is sharp, sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing, dividing, asunder. Soul and, is it soul and spirit? Discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I am so glad that it discerns between my thoughts and my intents. Because there's sometimes thoughts come into this brain ought not be there. God, that's not me. That's not what I meant. That's not who I am. That's not the desire of my heart. Sometimes I react to situations, and it's a thought, and it causes me to react, Brother Kenny, but that's not who I am. I'm so glad that the Word of God can discern. God understands the things that happen in my life, and sometimes my reaction, that's not who I am. That's just a flash of, of, of a reaction of a thought that happened in my mind, but God, that's not the intent of my heart. The intent of my heart is to please you. Aren't you so glad that God knows the intent of your heart? Now, when God reveals to you that, hey, this is displeasing to me, we have a choice. We can continue to allow ourselves to be affected by the issue at hand. Or we can take that into, under control and bring it to the obedience. Every thought, bring it to the obedience. Why? Because a thought begets an idea, and an idea begets a motive, and a motive begets a plan, and a plan begets an action, and an action begets who we are. It, be it becomes a character, a habit. But it all starts in the mind. So take every thought into subjection. How do I do that, Pastor? Become a worshiper. Filter everything through I'm a worshiper. Look at your neighbor and tell him I'm a worshiper. Come on, you are. I said you are. You're worshiping something. And you know what? God's looking for you. I said God's looking for you. Sister Sherry, Sister Cheryl, you guys look so much better closer. Unlike some of us. I want to continue talking to you today about a place to worship. A place to worship. Well, Pastor, we're in a place to worship. Yep. Absolutely right. You know what? When you go home, you're in a place to worship. Okay, here we go again. How many of you are human? Lift up your hand if you're a human. Are you a human just in the church? Are you a human when you go home? Are you a human on the job, Pastor? You're simplifying this. I know. Hopefully you'll get it. Forgive me. I'm being mean. I, I don't want to be that way. You're a human wherever you go, right? You're a worshiper. You're called to worship. I said, you're, we're not worshipers at church. We are worshipers, period. 
just as human as I am, I am a worshiper because I was created to worship him. So wherever I go, wherever I am, whatever situation I find myself in, hey, that's a place of worship. Andrew, you can worship God on a basketball court. When you miss, just thank you for another opportunity to try. Wherever we go, we're worshipers. If we could get this concept, and I'm going to tell you, I told you last week what we were. I'm going to tell you this week why we are what we are. Do you know God doesn't need your worship? Are you kidding me? He created the heavens and the earth and everything that was in the earth before there was a single solitary worshiper. Let there be light. Nobody was cheering him on. Well, I need worship so I can do something. No. God doesn't need our worship. But we need to worship God. I said we need. Our need is to worship God. Because it's through our worship that our lives are changed. Only worship can get your mind off of your problem. Something bigger than yourself. How many of you got big stuff going on? Sometimes negative. You need something bigger than your negative problem. Only thing bigger than your negative problem is a great big God. And God knew that you and I would have negative problems that get us spiraling out of control. He said, hey, the only way I can fix that is if I can change the direction of their perception. So, hey, this is a command. Worship God. The Bible says, for your, for your pleasure, we were created. So God said, worship. Not because he needs it, but because we need to. And I pray today before I'm finished, you'll find out every area of your life, you need to worship God. And every area of your life is a place to worship him. Pastor, you don't understand where I am. I don't care where you are. Because where you are is not where you're going. Where you are is not God's purpose for you. The only reason I care where you are is because it's a point, it's a it's a point of origin of where you're leaving and how to get out of there. Oh God, I'm help me. First Kings chapter 8 and verse 27. Solomon has created, built this most amazing temple. Amazing temple. I I read today, this this temple was 11 stories tall. That's a big place for back then. How did they have the brain power, the technology to build something 11 stories tall? Here's one better. It cost over, in today's standards, it cost over $200 billion to build. The gold and silver alone was worth more than $200 billion billion dollars. Just the gold and silver. Not the man hours. Not the bronze. Not the cedar. Never before or since has a building been built with such splendor. Solomon was all proud of himself. Priest went in to do his duties and dedicate the building of the Most High God. He walked in to this glorious building. I'm sure look around. Oh, my. OMG. And all of a sudden, the presence of God descended upon that place. And he, he was unable to complete his job as a high priest. And what once the temple had once took everybody's attention, now the glory of God descending far eclipsed the glory of the temple. And Solomon says in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 27, but will God indeed dwell in the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens can't contain you. How much less this house. That's an expensive house. You talk about understatement of the year. 
this house that I have builded you. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. You know I love this chapter. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. They're talking about where to, where to worship, how to worship. She says, y'all say in Jerusalem you're supposed to worship. Our fathers say here in this mountain in Samaria you're supposed to worship. Divided on worship. Jesus says, listen. The time's coming where it won't matter where you are. It's what he said. The hour cometh and now is. Look at your neighbor and say, now's the time. When true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Not in a place, not in a building, not confined to a building. Up until this time, you had to go to the temple to worship. But Jesus said, I'm getting ready to do something in the earth. My temple's going to be in the hearts of men. And wherever you are, that's the place that you need to start worshiping. Regardless of what's happening around you. Because God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, God, I need your help today. Anoint us one more time on this topic. God, somehow quicken to us. And help us grasp the concept of worship, the power of worship, how it works, oh God, between man and God. I pray God should anoint my lips, my vocabulary, most important, my spirit. And God, give us ears to hear the word of God. Give us understanding hearts that would transform our lives by the application of your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Never once said amen. Amen. Why don't you clap your hands to the Lord and thank God for a minute for his mercy and grace. Amen. Wow. A place to worship. You may be seated. Look at your neighbor and tell him, worship is not a feeling. It's a choice. It's a choice. I choose every time I come into the house of God whether or not I'm going to worship. So do you. I choose every day that I get up if I'm going to allow life circumstances to determine my attitude or if I'm going to be a worshiper. I choose. It's not a feeling. It is a choice. Worship finds its definition and purpose in the worthship of the subject being honored, not in the feelings or the circumstances surrounding the worshiper. It's all about the worshiped and not the worshiper. Therefore, worship is not dependent upon an environment or an emotion. Because God doesn't change. It was an amazing revelation that I received when I realized worship does not depend upon how I feel or what's happening in my life because worship is not about me. Worship is about God. Look at your neighbor and tell him, worship isn't about you. Come on, it's not. It's not about how I feel. It's not about what I'm going through. It's not about what's happening around me. Worship is about God because he is worthy. And when I do what God requires, I'm lifted up out of my situation. And things, things change. You need your situation to change. You become a worshiper right in the middle of it. Come on, how many of you find problems in your life and, and situations where you feel alone, you feel lost, you feel like there's no hope? How many of you ever found yourself there? How many of you get frustrated being in that spot? Misery loves company, so I've learned to invite God into my mess. It ain't no sense of me being miserable by myself. All my wife will do is just kick me while I'm down. So I'm going to go talk to God. And I'm going to begin to praise God in the middle of my problem. God don't want nothing to do with my problem. God's a God of order. God's a God of power and control. <laughs> you get God in the middle of your problem and see if things don't start working out. Or may maybe you just like the problem. <laughs> Maybe you like to be down. Maybe you like the frustration. Maybe you, maybe you key in on being, oh, God help us, victims. Not me. I'm so sick of victim mentality. I said, I'm so sick of being the victim. I want to be victorious. How about you? 
Come on, invite God into your place. How do you know God will be there? Because God inhabits the praises of his people. And I tell you what, if you'll just set up a little praise sanctuary wherever you are, it'll invite God right down into your mess. And God can't stand a mess. He'll start cleaning it up. Don't believe me? Try it. Try it. Worship. Worship. It denotes action. I didn't got time to go. I, I don't have time to go there. Lord, my notes are all messed up. Look, the heart that's full of worship looks for opportunity to express itself always. In the good times or the bad. In spite of and often because of difficulty or despair. A true worshiper realizes that it is in this communion with Almighty God that transforms them from the reality of earth. It may be a real problem, but it will transform you from that reality of earth into the serenity of heaven. Come on, I'm praying by the time I get done here, you'll get with me and understand. My God, if I just turn loose with a little bit of praise, I could be on top of this thing instead of it on top of me. God, come on now. Look, God's looking for worshipers. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what your circumstance is. It doesn't matter how bad you've blown it. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. If you're a worshiper, God's looking for you. We talked about her last week, the woman at the well. She was the outcast of society. Five husbands living with a man that wasn't her own. She wouldn't even go to the well at the same time everybody else went because they didn't want her around, and she didn't want them not wanting her around. So she shows up when it's not good. She shows up in the heat of the day, and guess who's sitting on the well? Look. Jesus, didn't, he didn't even want his disciples to go to Samaria. In fact, he, he forbid them to go to Samaria. Yet we find Jesus sitting on the well at Samaria. And the Bible says he must needs go through Samaria. He could have gone around it if he wanted to. Most people did on their way to Jerusalem. But no, Jesus said, I've got to go to Samaria. Why? Because there's a woman there that society has cast out. Nobody thinks she's worth anything. But she's a prime candidate for worshiping. You look at Samaria. It was a religious city. There was religious people there. You guys say you're supposed to worship in, in Jerusalem. Our fathers say we're supposed to worship here. There was a bunch of religious people there. God didn't go looking for the religious people. God went looking for a worshiper. And what the whole religious community couldn't do, one worshiper turns around and runs back into the city and turns a whole city on top of their head about the Messiah. You give me one person who has sold out. You give me one person that is thankful for what God's done in their life. You give me one worshiper and they'll turn their world upside down. Oh, pastor, what are you so excited about? What are you so wound up about? Because God's getting ready to do something. He's going to use worshipers. And I want to be one of them. Genesis chapter 22, 5 and 6. It's the first mention of worship. Abraham, 75 years old. He's been talking with God. God says, I'm going to give you a promise. God waits almost, what God waits 25 years to give him the promise. From the time we hear about it. Abraham's 100 years old and he has Isaac. About time. What you waiting on, God? And then Isaac comes, they laugh, they forget their weight, the travail's over. And for about 20 years, he enjoys the fellowship of, of his promised son. About 20 years old, things are starting to look good. Isaac's looking good. Everything's going the right way. Ah, come on. I can see how, God, you're going to do this. I can see how this is working out. God, I'm getting ready to, to give everything I got to this young man. This is amazing. And God says, hey, Abraham, you remember Isaac? Yeah, buddy. Thank you so much. Watch this. God's getting ready to do something for Isaac. Take thy son, thine only son. Yeah, and put a crown on his head. Ha! Uh -uh. Take him up to a mountain and I'm going to show you and offer him up as a sacrifice. What? Anybody else up there? This can't be right. We picked this story up. 
Abraham's going to the mountain. In, in, verse, tw- in verse 5, Abraham said to the young men, hey, you stay here. Me and Isaac, we're going to go up on the mountain and he, he's got a different definition of worship than me and you. That old man's got a screw loose. He's a fanatic. Mm -mm, He's got a promise. God's never let him down. God's always been faithful. God gave him that promise. I said God's always been faithful to you. God's always brought you through. Come on. If things are going a little rough, that's okay. You wait on God to perform the miracle. How could he call that worship? The writer of Hebrews tells us that he didn't stagger at the promises of God. He said, God promised me this boy. He promised out of this boy that my seed would continue and that all the nations of the world would be blessed. I'm fixing to go up here on this mountain and put a knife in this kid's chest and set him on fire and turn him into ashes. See, that's what you see. That's what you think about. Abraham remembered the promise. He said, if you think a child being born to a 90-year-old woman something, now that's something. That's crazy. Watch this. He said, if you think that's amazing, The writer of Hebrews said he knew that God would raise him up out of the ashes if need be. He said, if you think the birth of a 90-year-old woman something, you wait until God takes cremation ashes and recreates my son and resurrects him out of the ground. He said, now that's something to worship about. You got your eyes on the problem and not the solution. You got your eyes on the dilemma and not the miracle. You got your eyes on the problem and not the testimony. Come on. It's about time we start looking at a trial of our faith as an opportunity for a miracle. Oh, how can God get glory out of this? I don't know. Just hang on, step, fasten your seatbelt, and watch it happen. And we're going to go worship. I'm going to put a knife in his chest. I'm going to burn him to ashes. And God's going to resurrect him from the ashes. And we'll come again. That's how he could call that worship. You see, he knew the author and the finisher. You're going through a dilemma. You're going through a problem. You know the author. He gave you that birth of that that blessing, of that promise. Uh, Come on. He's also the finisher of your faith. Come on. God will never ask something out of you that he won't more than make it up. So what happens here? Abraham learns that a place of trial... Oh, it's time the church learned this. A place of trial, a place of sacrifice is a place of worship. That's some good stuff. How many of you go through a trial and suck your thumb? How many times you go through a trial and you're mad at God? How many times I go through a trial and I say, what? See how it's supposed to happen? Hmm. You can worship in a trial. You could call a trial a place of worship. Come on, sometimes God may call you to offer up the most expensive sacrifice that you have. That's okay. Offer it up and call it worship and see how he multiplies it and gives it back to you. I'm telling you, if Abraham hadn't offered up Isaac, he'd have never been the promised one because there's always got to be a birth, a death, and a resurrection to a promise. You go ahead and allow that thing to die in your life and call it worship. You wait till God resurrects this baby. You wait till you see the other side. You wait till tomorrow. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You wait till God gets done with this. Quit looking at the problem and start looking for the miracle. Then and only then can God fulfill that promise. 
Oh, let's go someplace else. Well, I still got a little bit of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody's figuring it out. Go ahead and worship in your dilemma and let God turn it into a miracle. Go ahead and worship in the middle of your problem and let God turn it into a place of blessing. Anybody can worship when things are going good, but a true worshiper doesn't care where they are, doesn't care what's happening. They're just going to magnify God. Let all hell break loose. I still have a purpose. Let this world mess up and go into chaos. I still got a purpose. Ha! Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, you want victory? You're going to worship your way to victory. You want your promise? You're going to worship your way to your promise. Pastor, things aren't always so good. I know it. I know it. And sometimes we mess our own world up. And we think God can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we think God can't help us because we messed it up too bad. How many of you ever been there with me? The rest of you, let me know when you mess up. Rejoice not against me, O oh my enemy, when I fall. Not if I fall, but when I fall, I'm going to get back up. Well, how are you going to get up? Though I sit in darkness, the Lord is going to be a light to me. Come on, you can get up again if you'll start worshiping. You can turn the light on in your darkness if you'll start worshiping. You can find direction. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Oh, you be careful out there, Michael. Don't you be, don't you be judging somebody else's worship now. That same David. <laughs> he said, "You think I was vile a while ago? You wait." <laughs> It do some of you some good to be a little vile in somebody's eyes as you get a glimpse of God's glory and how awesome he is. It take care of a little bit of that pride in our life that hinders the work of the Holy Ghost. Ah, but I messed up. You know that guy that we just talked about, David, the man after God's own heart? Yeah, that dude, he messed up. And he wasn't a kid when he did it. Brother Miller, st historians tell us he was in his mid-50s. He was old enough to know better. David, supposed to be out on a battlefield. The Bible says when the kings went to war, he stayed home. Let me tell you, you be careful. If you're not where God wants you to be, I tr trust me, the enemy's got a trap for you. David gets up off of his couch, people out there dying on a battlefield, and he's laying on a couch when he's supposed to be at war. If you're supposed to be in the house of God, you can be here. You're not afraid to be here, but you're watching me on the couch. Be careful. The enemy has a trap for you. Now, if you're afraid and you're concerned for your health, please stay home on the couch. I'm going to pray for you. But if you're just sitting there because it's easier, I'm telling you, you be careful now. The enemy has a trap set for you. David sees Bathsheba. He calls her up to his palace has an affair with a woman whose husband's off at war. It amazes me how 
sometimes good people can allow what they want to completely cause them to violate their own code of conduct. The deception of deception is deception. And we can self-justify anything. David was not a murderer. He was the gentle shepherd. He was not an adulterer. He was a man of moral integrity. You read the first book of Song or uh, first book of Samuel. That dude had some incredible integrity. Yet, yeah, the enemy lays a trap, has an adulterous affair with a woman. She's with child. He's trying to cover up the mess, so he kills her husband, has her husband killed. She has the child, and the prophet comes, and he puts his finger in his face, and he says, David, God's not happy with this, and as a result, the child's going to die. David's heart smites him. He repents. He lays on his face and he weeps and he cries. He fasts. He prays. And the baby gets worse, worse. To the point we pick this up in 2 Samuel 12 and 19. The servants were afraid to tell him. He's been so distraught. He, he's been so, so messed up on the inside. They're afraid to tell him this baby's dead. You know, be careful how harsh you judge yourself. You know, you can pronounce curse upon your own self. Certainly be careful how you judge others. Because when the prophet came and told him about, you know, the story about the guy that had a bunch of sheep and then the guy that had one sheep, the guy that had one sheep, he raised that sheep like it was a, a family member. And the guy with a bunch of sheep had a friend came and he killed the sheep from the guy that only had one, and he served it to his friend rather than killing one of his own, of his many in the flock. But a judgment rose up in the heart of David. He said, who is that man? He, he is going to die. He's going to pay fourfold. Be careful what judgment you cast out there. Because David judged himself. The Bible says, well, whatsoever measure you meet or that you judge, it'll also be met back to you. David said, he's going to repay fourfold. He judged himself, Brother Lashley. This baby, him and Bathsheba, died. Amnon rapes his sister. Absalom kills him and he dies. Joab kills Absalom in a rebellion. He died. After David's dead and gone, Adonijah rises up and tries to take the throne from Solomon, and he dies. He paid fourfold. You let God judge you. Because if you judge, come on, we're harder on ourselves than anybody else. Some of, you have, some of you have judged yourself right out of the anointing. Judge yourself right out of a calling. Judge yourself right out of a ministry. Let that go and let the blood of Jesus cover it and worship your way out of it. When David saw his servants whispered, he perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said... He's dead. What would you do? How would you feel? Where would your emotional mind be in that moment? What would be your next course of action? You've had an affair. You've killed the man of the woman that you had an affair with, and the child, your child has just died, but at the hand of your own sin. Now, that is a pretty bad place. How do you, that's impossible to get out of, Brother Lashley. How do you dig yourself out of that hole? Anybody got an answer? David did. Watch this. 
Verse 20, David arose from the earth, washed, anointed himself, changed his apparel, and came to the house of the Lord and You can worship your way out of a failure. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care how horrible you find what kind of a pit you found yourself in, even if you dug it and laid your own trap and stepped in it. I'm telling you today, you can worship your way out of a place of loss. Life isn't always about addition. There is an ebb and flow, a pendulum, if you please, good and bad. It rains on the just as well as the unjust. This lets us know that we can call a place of loss, a place of sorrow, and a place of horrid failure, a place of worship. You can carve out a place of worship wherever you are. Whatever situation you find yourself in, you can make it a place of worship. Oh, The more I preach this message, the more pages I have to throw away. Brothers and sisters, our world is in a place of chaos. Would you agree with me? It so affects who we are, and it so affects our church, our services. This isn't the normal place to worship. It doesn't look like our normal place to worship. It's not the normal atmosphere to worship. Agreed? I really don't like it. But it's a place of worship. And I can't afford to sacrifice worship on a feeling or an environment. Look, if you're feeling bad about this pandemic, if you're feeling frustrated at things that are going on, I get it. I understand You can't do anything about it, human speaking, but you can worship your way out of that environment. You can worship your way out of that pessimistic mindset. You, Well, pastor, I'm validated in what I feel. Be validated and mad if you want. I'd rather worship and be happy and content. I'd rather worship and have a miracle in the middle of a mess. Look, we ain't changing nothing. Physically, we can't change a thing. But spiritually, if you and I will get into a place of worship, I'm telling you, there is something that happens when God's people begin to worship. It draws men and women. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. If you and I will begin to lift up Jesus, magnify Jesus, not the problem. If we begin to magnify him as king of kings, lord of lords, the answer, the hope, peace, joy, the contentment of life. Life, if you and I will begin to magnify him, that will draw men and women to us. I follow this guy that on YouTube. Yeah, I, I, I get lost in YouTube sometimes. This guy's up in the Northwest Territories. He lives on a river. And the waters were really high this summer, and the river was all muddy. It was, it was a mess. And he'd, he'd walk out there. Usually, I don't know if you know anything about Canadian waters, but they're usually just pristine, blue, clear, just gorgeous waters. He'd walk to the edge of the bank with his video camera. And, yep, it's still a mess. And it did. It looked like my coffee in the morning. Just full of mud. And, oh, it was, it was, it was a mess. One day he said, I'm going fishing. But I ain't fishing in that. Got in his boat, he motored up against a stream, got himself upstream to where a mountain stream was flowing into the river. Got out of his boat and got up on the bank and took his video camera and shone up into that stream. That stream was probably eight foot deep, six foot deep, and you could see clear to the bottom. It was so beautiful, crystal clear. Why? Because it was flowing out of the rock. It was 
it was not affected. What was in the river couldn't make its way up into the stream because too much was flowing out of the stream and it was keeping itself pure. Let me tell you what, if you and I would get our strength and our water out of the rock Christ Jesus uh, and enough would flow out of us, we wouldn't have to worry about the mud and the muck that's flowing downstream in this world. We would be pure. Our spirit would be pure. We would not be tainted. Come on, what would happen if you and I would just begin to be wells of worship and not allow this mess to become a part of our lives and to flow upstream. Let me tell you, if enough volume's flowing out, nothing can get in. Now, this is amazing. He takes his rod and reel. He says, watch this. Now, he didn't throw up into the stream. Because where the stream flowed out into the river for about, oh, 30 yards, maybe 50 feet, maybe, I don't know. There was this space in the river that was crystal clear from the water coming out of the stream into the river. And so he takes his rod and reel and he throws a lure out into the river into the edge where it's coffee and where it's clear. And every single cast, he was pulling fish. Let me tell you what, if you and I would learn to allow the spirit of worship to flow out into our world, men are drawn to that clarity. Men and women are drawn to that purity. Men and women are hungry for truth. They're hungry for righteousness. They're looking for something that will sustain them. And if you and I, come on, he said he'd make us fishers of men. If you and I would allow this spirit to flow out of us, men and women would be drawn to the purity of God in us. There's enough junk flowing around this world. There's enough people puking out this mess. What would happen if you and I begin to let go with the presence of God, with the anointing of God, with the righteousness of God? There's something that flows out of a believer that draws men. I'm closing. Paul and Silas. They was going to go to Asia. Spirit said no. The Bible says it forbid them. I, I should have looked in the middle of service today and I forgot, but they was going to go somewhere else. You Bible scholars may know where that was. Was it Lydia? Bas- yeah, that place. And the scripture said, no, you can't go there either. Paul said, okay, where do you want me to go? And God gives him a vision. A man saying, come over here and help us to Macedonia. Him and little old Silas jump in a boat and they head to Macedonia as fast as the wind will take them. And they can't wait to get there because there is going to be a knockdown, drag out, amazing revival and harvest of souls. I cannot wait to get there. You wait and see what happens when we get there. The first city they come upon, Philippi. Bail out, buddy. Here it comes. And they get the living daylights beat out of them. The magistrates take them and beat them. Acts chapter 16, verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them. Now we read right over that. But the Bible says later on after the jailer received the Holy Ghost, he he took and mended their wounds. They needed medical attention when they got done with them. That wasn't it. Now, don't go time out. I'm trying to do the will of God. You told me I couldn't go over there. You told me to come here. And what's this? You ever felt that way? What would you do about it? Do you ever have a a, a divine directive of God and you went there and negative things happened? God ever told you to go and apologize to somebody or submit yourself to somebody or repent and it blew up in your face? Oh, you haven't had a good experience. God, well... What? What was that all about? I just did what you told me to do. And that blew up. 
I thought we were going to be brothers again. So what'd you do? Maybe God asked you to sacrifice something. You did it and things got worse. What'd you do? And how'd that work out for you? Chances are bitterness, frustration, loneliness, disillusionment. You certainly didn't feel quickened in your spirit, did you? You see, the enemy takes advantages of us, of us in times like that because it's natural to feel those ways. But you are a partaker of a divine nature if you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And you are called to worship. If things go good, you're called to worship. If things go bad, you're called to worship. If I can worship God when things are going bad in my life, then God can trust me to, to worship him and remain a worshiper with the right priority whenever I, when I attain unmerited favor. But if he can't trust me to worship him in the bad times, when things go good, I'll forget about him. You know, that was Israel's problem. In the wilderness, as long as everything was going good, Brother Lasher, they could worship, dance, sing, and shout, shake them little tambourines, kick them little Hebrew sandals up in the air and scream hallelujah. But you let them get a little bit thirsty, and they began to grumble and gripe and complain. And God said, you wait. I'm going to take, because you couldn't, didn't learn how to worship me in the tough times. When I get you into the land of plenty, and you, you reap uh, in vineyards where you haven't planted, and you drink out of wells you didn't dig, and you leave, live in homes that you didn't build, you'll forget about me. And they did. And Becky, I'm praying that God give me a spirit of worship that I can worship him when all hell's breaking loose in my life because I certainly want to be able to walk into a dimension and anointing and not forget or get the big head. Let me tell you. I ain't got time to tell you. Paul and Silas. Doing the will of God and things went south. I mean in a hurry, in a handbag. Put them in prison. Don't just put them in prison. Put them in the inner prison. You go look them things up. They were scary. Subterranean. Small. I get claustrophobic reading about them jokers. Paul and Silas are in the darkness. They're oppressed. They're beaten. Spiritually it was wrong. Just doing the will of God. Legally, it was wrong. They were both Romans. They are supposed to have a trial and convicted before any of that mess took place. But somebody just assumed that they were Jews, and so we could do whatever we want with them. And they beat the living daylights out of the poor guys and threw them in an inner prison. And instead of them sucking their thumb and being upset, we're just trying to do the will of God. Paul said, you know what? We can grumble and gripe in here, or we can praise in here. But we're in here. Let's just carve out a little place of worship where we are. Are you out of your mind? No. I can grumble and whine about it and continue this vortex. There ain't any further place to go south. We're as far down as we can get except death. Come on, Silas. Let's begin to sing praises to God. Can you pray in that kind of an atmosphere? Can you praise in that kind of an atmosphere? I, I'm, I'm serious. I'm closing really quick here. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. Can you praise God in that kind of a situation? Brother Clousy? I don't know. Can you praise God where you're at? Can you praise God for what you're going through right now? You may not be in a dungeon, but you may be in a prison in your own life, a prison in your own mind, a prison in your own situation. Watch. It's not conducive to worship. That's not a place. Prison is not a place of worship. Oh, yeah, it is. Watch this. If it was in the world, they'd say, hold my beer. Hold my beer. 
You finally smiled at me tonight. That's sad that it took that to get you to smile. It can't be done here. Watch. They begin to sing and praise, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened. That would have not happened if they hadn't been praising and singing. That would have never happened. Let me tell you what. You're never going to get out of your problem if you don't learn how to praise and worship your way out of it. The door is not going to open until you... You can grumble and gripe and complain. You can be upset. You can be frustrated. You can do anything you want to do. But until we learn to praise and worship where we are, the doors will not open. But I promise you, when you begin to turn that that issue into a praise session, when you begin to praise God in the middle of your prison, he'll make it a place of praise. He'll make it a place of miracles. He'll make it a place of testimony. All the doors were open. And this is the last part that I want to get to. You think you're the only one with problems? There was a bunch of people in prison that day. There was a bunch of people that were shackled that day. There were a lot of people sitting on the pew next to you that's going through a difficult time too. There's a lot of people, your brothers and sisters, that are having difficulty right now. But as Paul and Silas began to praise God, notice everyone's bands were loosed. You don't know what your worship will do, not just for you, but for the person sitting next to you, for the family that's sitting behind you, for that brother or sister that's sitting in front of you, that's facing such stuff. They don't know if they can even worship God. They don't have the strength. But if you will begin to worship God, if you will begin to praise God, you may open the bands. You may open the door. You may loose the shackles from a brother or sister that's having great difficulty right now. I wonder what would happen in this auditorium today if you would stand to your feet and you'd carve out a little bit of praise. You'd carve out a little altar, a space where you could offer up praise and worship, a place where you could begin to magnify God. I wonder what would happen in your world. I wonder what would happen in your brothers and sisters' world if you would begin to offer up praise unto the Most High God. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Yeah. Worthy is the Lamb. God, this isn't about me. This is about you. God, I magnify you. Oh, come. Let us exalt his name together. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, that is within me. Bless his holy name. Forget not his benefits. Forget not his benefits. Forget not how God. God's been good to you. Forget not how God's promised you. Forget not how God's brought you this far. Forget not how he's had his hand on you. Forget not where he's taken you to. Forget not the hope that he's given you. Forget not the forgiveness of sin. Forget not the hope that we have in glory. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord. Are things perfect? No, that's why I'm worshiping. Is life great? No, that's why I'm magnifying Him. Everything going your way, Pastor? Oh, quite the contrary. That's why I've got to find my place in worship. I'm a worshiper. I'm a worshiper forever I'm a worshiper come on can you praise God out of your dilemma can you praise God out of your failure can you praise God out of your oppression can you praise God out of your pain can you praise God come on out of your bitterness can you praise God out of your offense can you praise God out of a broken marriage can you praise God out of a broken relationship can you praise him Can you praise God out of sorrow? Can you praise God out of loss? Job said, the Lord giveth. And I praised him. 
the Lord taketh away. He didn't stop there. Blessed. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Are you out of your mind, Job? Nope. Yea, though he slays me. Yet will I trust him. And when he's finished, I'll come forth a true worshiper. Gold tried in the fire. Come on. Let me give you a hint. There is a God of this world. And if you or I allow anything to steal our worship, trust me, he's going to play on that time and time and time and time and time again. If offense causes me, hinders my worship, I'm going to walk a road of offense. If failure causes me to be less active and passionate in my worship, there's going to be test and trial and tribulation and pitfall after pitfall after pitfall in my life. Let me tell you something. I, I've learned this the hard way. It's hard to worship God out of condemnation. But it's easy to worship God out of a forgiven spirit because gratitude just wells up. Oh my God, I can't believe you forgave me again. You thought I was worth saving. When I didn't think I was worth saving, somehow you saw value in me. So you call it hypocritical? You call it whatever you want. When I have fallen short of the mark, when I failed even by my own standards, much less by God's, I used to allow it to send me into a vortex. Because for the mic, I didn't feel worthy to come into the presence of God. I felt like a hypocrite coming in the presence of God. And I got a hold of that incredible book. Brother Ralph Hamilton gave me a book many years ago. And next to the Bible, it's been the most life-changing book I've ever read. It's The Why and the Wonder of Worship by Brother Arnold. So when... I've fallen short. I realize that if I stay there focused on it, it's going to destroy my faith. It's going to destroy my confidence in God and myself, my relationship with God. So I've learned to quickly go to a place of prayer and ask God to forgive me. And Sister Flowers, I use that failure as a catalyst or a trigger to begin to worship. It drives Satan insane. Do you believe that the highest archangel should worship our Lord Jesus? Do you believe that the lowest demon must bow its knee in worship to Almighty God? Then somewhere in between those two, you and I fall. It was, Brother John, it was so liberating when I found out my worship didn't determine my merit. Being a worshiper doesn't, doesn't matter how good I am, how bad I am, how great I am, how, bo how poor I am. Being a worshiper doesn't matter about any, how, how holy I am, how sinful I am. How liberating is that? So I come into the presence of God, washed afresh in his blood. You need to do that anyway because our righteousness is as filthy rags before him. So you need to do that anyway. 
And then just worship with total abandonment because it isn't about your worth. It isn't about your goodness. It isn't about anything except his greatness and who he is. And as you begin to worship, he pulls you up out of that failure. He pulls you up out of that dilemma. He pulls you up out of that feeling of despair. And all of a sudden, everything's right again. So don't you again allow despair, failure, frustration. Don't you dare let it hinder your worship because your worship is what pulls you up out of that mess and reinstates you. Can you fix a problem on your own? Can you fix a single sin? Oh, I know I'm, 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 I'm belaboring this point, but I, I just feel this in the Holy Ghost. Sometimes we feel like we got to do penance for our sins. I can't worship God because, well, I just messed up yesterday. So I, I've got to repent, and I've got to read the Bible. I've got to fast. I at least got to wait a week before I can get back into God's presence and worship Him, right? Don't look at me so funny. We don't say those things, but we feel in our spirit, I can't come into the presence of God yet. So I got a question for you. How long do you, how long do you think you got to do penance? If it's a real bad thing, maybe two weeks, maybe a month. I know we Pentecostals don't call it penance. That's what it is. It makes about as much sense. So watch this. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. A thousand years as a day. So, say you're going to do penance for a week. What's a week compared to a thousand years? A couple seconds, maybe? So if you do penance for a month, do you got a thousand years? Do you got a thousand years? Because that's only one day before the Lord. So if you're going to do it for seven days, that means you got to do it for 7,000 years. Well, that's the exact number the earth's been here or going to be here. What I'm trying to tell you is the enemy will get you out of, it will irrationally get you out of a place with God that God can use you. Don't allow your sin. Listen, if David could get up off the floor and go into the house of God and worship, certainly you and I can do the same thing. Once again, would you lift your hands to heaven and tell God, I'm going to make wherever I am a place of worship regardless of what's going on around me, God. My circumstances do not dictate my place of worship. My place of worship is wherever I find myself. Goodness, badness, blessing, trial, tribulation, victory matters not, God. It's a place of worship. Failure, success, doesn't matter. It's all a place of worship. I'm going to be a worshiper. I'm going to worship you forever. I've, conv- I've committed in my spirit, regardless of what happens around me, I'm going to grasp this concept of worship, God, because I need it. I've got to have it. Uh, I've got to have it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, because God doesn't change. Come on, who is he? Waymaker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. Come on, that's who God is. Ah, yes. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. Oh, that's who God is. Why don't you worship?
worship him as that and let him make a way for you. Let him make a way in your darkness. Uh, come on, let him keep that promise. Uh, my God, that is who you are. Oh, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Sing it. Way maker, miracle worker.
God's never going to stop working on your behalf. The message that Pastor brought today, in my darkest days, I can still step out into the light of God's grace by worship. There is a strength, there is an anointing there. And when I was worshiping at the end, I was I actually made up a word, a fountain of I was making an artesian well, a fountain of praise and of worship to the Lord. I got to chuckling to myself. I thought, Lord, you know what? That's what people want to see. They don't want me showing up with this dour, oh, I'm this Christian. I'm suffering through this difficulty. But I remember a testimony of a lady who's no longer in the church talking about going through a difficult time in her life. And friends kept coming on. She was a stronger witness at that time because they said, how do you still have the joy of the Lord? Why? Because they see it on my countenance. It's not going to be a fake joy. It's not going to be a fake smile that you make that draws into. It's going to be the love of God that is truly, genuinely shining out of you that draws hungry men and women to you. And you can testify, look what God did for me in a similar situation. You'll be able to be a blessing to them. I encourage you, worship through everything you face this week. Testify, let other people know, look what God did in my situation. My dad told me about how God started to work on his knee, how God began to help there. I was expecting him to have surgery. It was just that testimony that increased my faith and then everyone I tell about that. Look what God did to my father. It's a blessing to them. Go and tell your own testimony. Worship. Lift up God believing and look what God will do. Go in the favor of God. Let anointing flow through this week in Jesus' name. You're dismissed.